what Democrats are beginning to experience now is not just people who are sort of shifting their minds. They're beginning to actually experience for the first time serious threat in terms of voter registration. So Democrats have an excellent get out the vote game. They have an excellent voter registration game. It's why Democrats in nearly every state in America that they have power have attempted to push something like a motor voter law. They want to register as many voters as Democrat as humanly possible when they get to, for example, the DMV. And then they want universal balloting via mail-in ballots, and they want ballot harvesting, right? The idea is if you can get a bunch of casual voters who don't pay too much attention to politics, but can be shamed by the media into voting for Democrats to vote, you do it. And so Democrats have a, in, in almost every purple state, Democrats have some sort of voter registration advantage. That's beginning to turn. If people start openly registering as Republicans, what that means is that the sort of stigma that the media have been able to attach to identifying as Republican is going away. And if that happens, Democrats have a real problem on their hands. As Carl Rove points out, if you look at Florida in 2016, Democrats had held a registration edge of 330,000 votes of Republicans. Donald Trump still won the state. So did Senator Marco Rubio. The Democratic advantage then dwindled to 257,000 in 2018, 97,000 in 2020. Today, there are 176,000 more Republicans than Democrats registered in the state of Florida. That is the first time in Florida history the GOP has led in registrations. So if Republicans were winning in Florida, if Donald Trump was winning Florida in 2016, When Democrats had a 330,000 vote edge, there's been about a half million vote switchover to the Republicans, or at least Republicans have gained half a million votes in the interim between 2016 and 2022. So how bad do you think those elections are going to be for Democrats? Carl Rove says, consider two other battlegrounds where incumbent Democratic senators could face challenges. In Arizona in 2016, the GOP registration edge stood at 148,000. It narrowed to 136,000 in 2018 and 130,000 in 2020. This year, however, the Republican margin has jumped back to 145,000. In Nevada, the GOP lagged Democrats by 88,000 registrations in 2016. Republicans cut the deficit to 75,000 in 2018. It bounced back to 87,000 in 2020. Since then, the GOP has reduced the gap to 51,351 voters. That's the smallest election year difference since 2004, which, not coincidentally, is the last time Nevada voted Republican for president. The same thing is happening in Pennsylvania. Trump carried Pennsylvania by 44,000 votes in 2016. Senator Pat Toomey won re-election by 87,000 votes, even though Democrats outnumbered Republicans by almost a million voters, 916,000 voter registration advantage on, in favor of Democrats in 2016. The Democratic advantage has now dropped all the way to 550,000. I mean, that is a shift of, again, about 400,000 votes. That is a big number. Same thing is true in places like North Carolina, Independent voters are also trending Republican at this point. So that doesn't mean that Republicans can run bad candidates and necessarily win. It's going to be a problem for them in Georgia, for example. Could be a problem depending on what happens in Pennsylvania with Mehmet Oz. But the the bottom line here is that Democrats have moved away from the center of the country. A lot of the reason that Democrats have moved away from the center of the country, by the way, is because they literally are disconnected from the things that regular people do on a daily basis. There's a fascinating piece by Roy Teixeira, who, again, is a left-leaning political theorist. He had a theory that I've talked about extensively on the show. He called the emerging Democratic majority. And his theory, it was in the early 2000s, about 2004. He wrote wrote a book with John Judas by this name. His basic theory is that as the minority population of the United States rose, Democrats would then be in an unbelievable, irrefutable position to win elections. They would be in, in an unmatchable position when elections because minorities were voting heavily Democrat. The number of white voters as an overall percentage of the population was declining. Therefore, if you had a growing number of a demographic that voted Democrat and a shrinking number of a demographic number that voted Republican, you would end up with a permanent Democratic majority. Instead, as he recognized earlier this year, Roy Teixeira, that is not true anymore. Hispanics are now moving into the Republican camp. The reason for that is because the Democratic Party has now been captured by highly educated white coastal elites, particularly female elites who hail from highfalutin colleges, that that their ideology is driven almost entirely by people with that value system. And that is a complete disconnect from the blue collar values, the religious values, the working values of many Americans. So Roy Teixeira writes this today. Democrats are betting on a small set of issues to mitigate their losses this November. Inflation may have just hit a 40-year high with concomitant recession risk, but Democrats believe that campaigning against the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, arguing for more gun control in the wake of recent mass shootings, highlighting Trump's anti-democratic malfeasance through the January 6th hearings, can turn the tide in their favor. It's true that the polls have tightened a bit in Democrats' favor recently, though some of this could be the eagerness of motivated Democrats to be polled. And there's general agreement that Democrats' chance of holding the Senate are much better than their chances of holding the House. 
Now, that's obviously true. Re- Republicans are going to take the House. The, the only reason that, that the Senate is even up for debate is because, again, Republicans have not been clear in nominating really strong candidates in places like Pennsylvania or Georgia or Arizona, where there's still an open primary going on. Recent data indicate the success for the abortion gun control January 6th strategy, to the extent it is working, is attributable to those voters for whom these issues loom large and are less likely to be influenced by current economic problems. Such voters are disproportionately likely to be college-educated whites. It is here that Democrats have been demonstrating unusual strength. Well, this is right. The Democratic Party is now run entirely by white coastal elites. In a just-released New York Times Siena poll, Democrats have a 21-point lead on the generic congressional ballot among these voters. White college Democratic support in this poll is actually higher than support among all non-white voters. Okay, that is a dramatic reversal for the Democratic Party. It used to be that college-educated voters were split kind of half-half in this country, and minority voters split heavily Democrat. Now it's precisely the opposite. So if the demographic argument still holds, which is that there are fewer white voters overall and there are more minority voters, but now the white voters are trending toward the Democrats and the minority voters are trending toward the Republicans, that throws the whole kit and caboodle up in the air for the Democrats. Roy Teixeira says, this is remarkable and has much to do with anemic Hispanic support for Democrats who favor Democrats over Republicans by a scant three points. Remember, Barack Obama won Hispanics like two to one. Even in 2016 and 2020, Donald Trump won like 35% of Hispanics in 2020. Now it is dead even, which is insane. And again, that is because Democrats have embraced a set of values that no one who is not a gender theory major at Wellesley cares about. No one agrees with it. It seems bizarre to them. They've cut themselves off in this bubble where they talk to all of their friends and where you are thrown out of the bubble and treated as a leper if you don't agree with them. Says Roy Teixeira, more broadly, the lack of Democratic support among working class voters is striking. Democrats lose all working class voters by 11 points. They carry college educated by 23 points. This is not a class gap. It's a yawning chasm. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion Democrats' emphasis on social and and democracy issues, while catnip to some socially liberal educated voters leaves many working class and Hispanic voters cold. Their concerns are more mundane and more economically driven, which, by the way, is the way politics is supposed to work. You're supposed to be saying to your politicians, you're the plumber, fix the problem. You're not supposed to look to them for worldview guidance. And yet that's what Democrats do. They see in politicians godlike heroes descending from on high to bring them LGBTQ plus minus divided by its sign ampersand tilde theory. Well, that's not how most people see their politicians, particularly people who actually have to work for a living. And the reality is that the Democratic base, the people who create the ideology, most of them have never run a business. Many of them have never worked in a business. Many of them are professional pointy heads. They've either worked in academia or they've worked at a think tank or they work in politics at the behest of the taxpayer or they're working in some sort of nonprofit. The, the, the number of Democrats in elite positions shaping politics who have never held a real business job is extraordinary. There's a piece over at Daily Wire by Ben Zeisloff today saying most top Biden officials have zero years of business experience. Well, that might help shape why exactly it is that they are so out of touch on the issues that most Americans care about. If you've owned a business, if you've worked at a business, you understand that inflation is a top priority for the United States government. If you own a business or work in a business, you understand that supply chain issues are more important than Pete Buttigieg trying to induce equity via transportation policy. If you have worked at a business or you own a business, you understand that the future of your business is more important to you than Democrats' insistence that abortion policy be the number one thing that we discuss or that HHS be dramatically focused on transing the children. This is not the stuff that you're interested in, but the Biden administration is not led by those people. A report from the Committee to Unleash Prosperity recently revealed that the Biden administration is led by lawyers, academics, and community organizers. According to the conservative think tank, the top 68 individuals in the administration have spent an average of 2.4 years in the business world, 2.4 years, with only one in eight boasting extensive business experience. The median length of business experience for Biden officials is zero years, which means there was like one guy who had 20 years of experience and everybody else has zero years of actually working in the business world. The report says, surely we want our political class to have a diversity of backgrounds. We want lawyers, grassroots activists, those with political and policy experience, scientists, health experts, academics. But we also want people who have experience running large operations with hundreds and thousands of employees and who understand logistics. Biden, Harris, neither has any business experience. Neither does Janet Yellen. Marty Walsh, who's Secretary of Labor, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai, no experience in the business world. The only ones who do are people like Gina Raimondo of Commerce and Ron Klain, White House Chief of Staff. They both worked in venture capital. And again, even venture capital is largely disconnected from the concerns of the average American. 
The Committee to Unleash Prosperity also evaluated members in the Trump administration. In addition to Trump's 45 years in business, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross had 42 years. Mnuchin had 25 years. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos spent 23 years in the arena. So when you're completely disconnected, when you when you are all drawn from the same demographic background, and I don't mean like in terms of race, I mean in terms of the ideology you spout, you end up with this bubble that is completely disconnected from the base that you were supposed to be cultivating right here. According to Roy Teixeira, Recent data from Echelon Insights provides an interesting window on the contrast between the people who are leaving the Democratic Party and the so-called Democratic base. Their analysis breaks down the electorate into four quadrants, conservative, populist, libertarian, and liberal, and further breaks out a strong progressive subset of liberals who are highly liberal on most issues and also happen to be very highly educated and more likely to be white. They represent about 10% of voters. They bear some similarity in size, demographics, and inclinations to the progressive activist group broken out in the brought, broken out in the more in common study. We've discussed that study on the show, a group with a lot of weight inside the Democratic Party, but amounting to a very small sliver of the electorate. The cross tabs provided by Echelon allow for a comparison of strong progressives' basic political views with those of Hispanic and working class voters. Here are some examples. Poll question. Is America the greatest country in the world or not? 66 to 28, strong progressives say America is not the greatest country in the world. 70 to 23, Hispanics say America is the greatest country in the world. Working class voters, Agree, 69 to 23. So precisely the reverse. Precisely the reverse. 66 to 28. Strong progressives are like, America sucks. And everybody in the working class like, no, America's kind of great. You think that the people who are saying America sucks are going to be able to appeal to the people who think that America's a pretty great place? How about the view that racism is built into our society, including policies and institutions, versus racism comes from individuals who hold racist views, not from our society and institutions? Strong progressives say by a margin of 94 to 6, that America is societally and systemically racist. Hispanics say that racism comes from individuals by a margin of 58 to 36. So all of your intersectional Latinx pandering is nonsense. Hispanics don't buy it. They know they can get ahead in America because America is not systemically racist. By the way, working class voters, the people who Democrats are pandering to by saying, we'll throw you a welfare check and we'll tell you that, that your economic dispossession is a result of systemic racism. Those working class voters are like, nah, we don't believe you. 57 to 33. They agree that racism comes from individuals who hold racist views. How about illegal immigration? Should the government deal with illegal immigration by making it easier to immigrate legally? Or should we increase border enforcement? Strong progressives say we should make it easier to immigrate legally. 97 to 2. Hispanics are split 44 to 47. Working class voters endorse more border security 58 to 32. And the list goes on and on. So, for example, polling data from Echelon Insights. On the question of transgender athletes being able to play on sports teams that match their supposed preferred sex, what do people think about this? Strong progressives say that men should be able to play on women's teams by 66 to 19. Hispanic voters say 64, 22, no. Working class voters say 63, 22, no. How about reallocation of money from police departments to social services? Strong progressives say yes, 87 to 12. Hispanic voters say they want more funding to the police, 50 to 41. Working class voters say 59 to 31. How about hard work and determination? So according to strong progressive voters, they are not a guarantee of success for most people. According to progressive voters, 88 to, to 12, 88 to 12, they say that most people who want to get ahead cannot get ahead because of the systemic problems with American society. Hispanic voters say that if you work hard, you're likely to get ahead, 55 to 39. Working class voters, 55 to 40. So Roy Teixeira says, strong progressives clearly live in a different world than Hispanic and working class voters. In strong progressive world, views on abortion, gun control on January 6th fit neatly into an overarching set of sociocultural beliefs that are highly salient to them and increasingly drive the Democratic Party's priorities and rhetoric. Hispanic and working class voters lack this overarching set of beliefs. In fact, they don't share many of them. They are much more concerned with the basics of their material lives. Josh Krashauer notes Democrats are becoming the party of upscale voters concerned about gun control and abortion. Republicans are quietly building a multiracial coalition of working class voters with inflation as an accelerant. That is clearly right. And Democrats are about to take it directly on the chin because of all of this. And because, again, there's an elite class inside the Democratic Party that is concerned with the things that most Americans are just not concerned with. How's this for a title? Ben Shapiro Show subscriber destroys like button with clicks and logic. I'd watch that. Make it happen, gang.